Okay, so welcome to the Real-Time Digital Signal Processing Laboratory class at the University of Texas at Austin, spring 2014 semester. So this is uh, lecture 10 on data conversion, and this is actually part two, uh, but let me set up part two. Um, this is uh, some available products that are out there, and I, I point them out for a couple reasons. One is to show that as you increase uh, sampling rate, you're going to decrease the number of bits per sample. There's a kind of an uh, intuitive trade-off in that if I have an increase in sampling rate, I have a decrease in sampling time. It means I have less time to quantize an amplitude value, an analog amplitude value. So I'm going to have less accuracy in the number of bits per sample, unless I'm willing to put a lot more money uh, in, into the cost of the product for both design time and, and manufacturability. So here are four products that I've picked out. Um, and if you look at the sampling rates, they're shown here on the on the kind of the right side of this. And so you'll start down here at 500 kilosamples per second. And in this data converter language, they tend to go with kilosamples per second instead of kilohertz. But it's the same, it's the same thing. Um, so this is 500 kilosamples per second at the low end. And you'll see that that's way more than we would need for any sort of audio uh, sampling. And this gives us 24 bits per sample. It's pretty good. It's 24-bit audio. And this is a test and measurement. Um, piece of equipment, so you really expect it to be of higher precision than what you're testing. So you're willing to spend a little bit more money on these sort of rack-mounted equipment. So this would be a, a board that plugs into a, a PXI chassis, as you see here. Um, so it'd be rack-mounted, and the board's about maybe the size of a hand or, or a hand and a half. Okay, so if you're willing to put in the money, you can certainly get this kind of resolution. As you move up the sampling rates to 15 mega samples per second, you're now down to 16 bits per sample, you now move up to 100 mega samples per second. You're now down to 14 bits per sample. And up to 2 giga samples per second, you're up to 8 bits per sample. There's another part in this family that actually samples at 12 giga samples per second and 8 bits, I think 8 bits per sample, a pretty expensive piece of equipment. Now, so that we'll talk about this today and how this actually gets designed in practice. It won't be the standard theory of anti-aliasing filtering, sampling, and quantization. There'll be some other way to do it using sigma-delta modulation or some other alternative method. There are many alternatives. We'll talk about sigma-delta today. Okay, good. This is first, this actually is part two of lecture 10, I'm, and the first half uh, deals with uh, the image processing side of this, which is called half-toning for printing and display. And so I'll be, that's be part one. Part two, we'll move right into the, the main part of the talk, which is on sigma-delta modulation. OK. All right, again, this is the standard way to do it. This is the old, kind of old-style analog to digital and digital analog converters. This is the theory of what, you know, we, and the theory still applies. It's just a matter of the implementation will be different. So in the theory, um, and, and it was the implementation before the mid-1980s, and occasionally it still is. If the sampling rate's low enough, and the number of bits per sample is low enough, then this, this is viable. This is a reasonable way to do it. But for really high sampling rates, or for lots of bits per sample, like in audio, not going to do it this way. It just, and I'll show you why in the coming slides and how we would do it. So the ADD converter, again, in theory, we're going to have a low-pass filter. Its job is to... Reduce frequencies at or above half the sampling rate, and probably a 10% roll off. So that part's not too bad. Okay, so that's reasonable enough. The difficulty comes in uh, later when we talk about the number of bits that we want to quantize. So what was the formula for quantization, signal to quanti quantization noise? From the input to the quantizer to the output as a function of V, what was that formula? Right, so it's, so it's 60 B per bit plus some constant. So I have S and R across the quantizer in dB. So it's 6 bits plus some constant. And that constant depends on quantizer settings and the average power in the input signal. And in audio, it's somewhere between 1 and 2 dB. Other applications have a different value for C0, but something, you know, 4 dB, something like that. So a small number. All right. And so we get this increase of 60 dB per bit in the SNR. This means that, as we talked about in Lecture 8 for quantization, that tells us that the stop and attenuation 
for the analog low pass filter is now a function of the number of bits that we want. All right, so we're trying to separate, we're trying to get as much of the input signal through the quantizer and as little quantization noise as possible. That's our hope. But the reality is, um, you know, we've got to really have a high SNR to support a certain number of bits. And we derive this in lecture eight slides. Okay, so this means that the stop in attenuation for our filter is e because the pa if the pass band is zero dB, then the stop band, that's our target, the ripple is, I'll talk about that in a second, the stop in attenuation is going to be equal to the SNR. So this is going to be 6B plus some constant. So if I want 16-bit audio and my constant is, say, 2 dB, now I'm looking at 98 dB of stop and attenuation. This is an incredibly high-order filter. And, it, and, it, and the more components you add to your analog design, the more you have to worry about noise effects, just the thermal noise effects, and how that's going to be amplified in the, in the actual analog circuitry. All right, so we'll talk about that in just a second. Now, the passband ripple, it turns out, is also a function of the number of bits per sample. Go ahead. No, these are, these are separate blocks. So I have an analog low-pass filter followed by a sampling block. This is the theory part. This is the theory part. Implementation will be slightly different. But I'm trying to explain why this theory doesn't really lend itself to a, to a, to a cost-effective implementation for either a high number of bits per sample or a high sampling rate. This one right here, the one I'm circling. So this one is the right up front. We want to attenuate frequencies at or above half the sampling rate. We'd love to eliminate them if we could. We can't, but we can at least attenuate them. And the amount of attenuation is determined by the stop band attenuation specification, right? So, and so what you want to do is you want to be able to basically put those frequencies that are out of the band of interest, that is to say at or above half the sampling rate, you don't want them showing up in your quantizer output. So you're trying to match um, the re basically the level of noise after filtering that's out of band to the quantization noise. To match the two of them, we need this kind of stop band attenuation, and it's pretty severe. It's pretty high to meet. Now, this is the pass band. This is the tar This is the pass band amplitude. So the pass band ripple. This is really the pass band. Uh, this is really the magnitude. Really the magnitude of the passband to be more accurate. The magnitude of the passband is uh, zero dB. The actual passband ripple, we're going to do this in the review slides, but it's going to be basically the passband ripple. This is the ripple. The ripple parameter is going to be equal to the least significant bit. Basically, what is that level? In other words, for the frequencies that are in the pass band, we would like to accurately represent them all the way down to the least significant bit that comes out of the quantizer. And any noise or interference that's outside of the band of interest, at or beyond half the sampling rate, we don't want to see it in the quantizer output. Okay, so hopefully, we, if we've matched the stop band attenuation with the quantization noise floor, the two noise floors are equal, then we won't see it. So that's our hope. This is what we'd like to design. The problem is, this is also dependent on B. So this gets smaller with increasing B, right? Because the, the least significant bit for the same min-max voltage in the quantizer, if I add more bits, it means that my step size is smaller. So this is equivalent to the step size. So this is the step size in the quantizer. So this is the step size in dB. And it gets smaller with increasing B. So as I increase B, I have two, two sources of bad news. Passband ripple gets smaller, stop and attenuation gets bigger. My filter order goes much higher every time I increase a bit. Oh, no, it's a, less ripple is good. So less ripple in the pass band is a good thing. So we want to reduce the, in other words, any frequencies that we're passing, we want to accurately represent all the way down to the least significant bit. 
any that's the frequencies in the fast band from zero to, you know, almost half the sampling rate. So it's 0.9 times half the sampling rate. For frequencies above half the sampling rate or at half the sampling rate, we really don't want to have those even affecting the output of our quantizer. We'd love to have that just buried in the thermal, in the quantization noise. Right, so, the, so, the, uh, so if I were to draw the magnitude response of this filter, so here's the magnitude response of the analog low pass filter, and here's the stop band, and here's the pass band. I know the stop band is less than half the sampling rate, and I know that the pass band is 0.9 times the pass the stop band, just to let the 10% roll off happen. Now I want here's the ripple. There's your ripple parameter of your pass band, and the stop band is this parameter here. So there's a stop. Right, so there's my stop band attenuation, right? And so it's going to basically, again, any frequencies at or above half the sampling rate are going to alias on me. What I want to, what I'm trying to do is control the aliasing. Okay, and I'm going to control the aliasing by pushing the, the noise, the whatever power or whatever signal amplitudes are, are there above half the sampling rate, they're going to alias. But I'm gonna I'm gonna filter them so hard or so harshly in the stop band that when the alias we're not gonna hear it. It won't even affect the least significant bit. That's the hope. Okay, go ahead. So are you trying to say that like when you when you're adding more bits, it's not so much that the attenuation is just is automatically going to the stop band, but it's more that you need to add more attenuation in order for it to be good. That's right. In order for all B bits to be good. If you don't adjust the stop band and you add more bits, then those last bits you've added are just noise. You're just quantizing noise. Okay, so in other words, if I give you, we did this in lecture eight, if I give you an SNR rating, you can work back to figure out how many bits are really um, trustworthy in the quantization. So in lab, you're quantizing the 16 bits, but reality for the analog to digital converter in lab, only the, first thir only the most significant 13 bits are good. The bottom three, the, the three least significant bits are noise and interference and nonlinear stuff, harmonics and whatever. But it's easier to read 16 bits than 13, right? So you read 16 bits and you just work with it like it's 16 bits, but you have to remember that those last three bits aren't so good. So is the fact that like the, the three high bits are insignificant coming from the fact that since your pass band is going to be before your stop band, you're going to already see some attenuation from the analog low pass filter? Before you hit your quantizer, or is that completely unrelated? No, it's completely. So the analog low-pass filter is basically passing the frequencies we want to, you know, capture and sampling, and reducing significantly the frequencies that are going to alias on us from sampling. Right. Like, I guess Absolutely. where my question is coming from is like, if I'm trying to stop sampling at like one kilohertz, mm -hmm. my pass band is going to be like uh, nine, nine hundred hertz, right? What if I sample at one kilohertz? It means that my I can only capture up to 500 hertz, right? Right, right. So, so, so my my pass band that. would end probably around like 450. Right. So I'm saying like the, the high frequencies from like, like let's say like 450 to like 500 hertz. That so transition band. Damping, right? Yeah, the transition band is going to get dampened, but it won't be. You know, the, the, remember the transition. So here's our. So the filter we designed might look something like this. It's elliptic, it would, these, this would be IR filter designs. So I'll probably get something like this. Right? 
And so in the transition band between F pass and F stop, so here's F pass and here's F stop. So in the transition band, I get, you know, decreasing. Now one can argue that in the pass band, I really want not a ripple, I want a monotonic decay. And that is also used in design. So that'd be one of the Chebyshev designs or Butterworth. Right, so Chebyshev have two different types. One type had monotonic decay in the pass band, and one had monotonic decay in the stop band. But to get the order down, we're going to go elliptic. Right? To get the minimum order design, we're going to go elliptic. But you will see other kinds of designs in, in audio and other applications. But again, we're not going to, the whole thing is that, my whole point of this slide is, it's really hard to, to not just design this analog filter, but to implement it with increasing B. So the next slide. Now it also turns out, it also, as B increases, it also puts pressure on the quantizer. Quantizer has to be much better. So every time that I add a bit, I have to add essentially a whole nother level of comparators, which have to be uh, twice as accurate as the stage before them. This is a problem. So if you look at an 8-bit quantizer is something that we can build and get pretty good results from. 16-bit quantizer, I'll show you the plots in a second not going to be very good at the low bits. It's hard to get the comparators to work over such a wide range of, of accuracies. Remember, in the, in the quantization, the first thing we're going to do is compare against zero. Is the amplitude greater than zero, less than zero? Then we compare against just you know, divide and conquer, almost a binary search. We'll do a compare again at half, half that voltage from zero to max, and then a fourth of that range, an eighth of that range, sixteenth of that range. So as I go through the quantizer, my comparators have to get more and more accurate all the way to the bottom. And if we have 16 bits, it means that the, point is that the comparator accuracy at the end is, is 2 to the B greater than the original comparator accuracy. That's incredibly hard to design. A level, oh, this, is, no, this is an SNR rating, but in the end, I have to get a number out of the quantizer. I have to get a... Oh, you mean like the resolution? Correct. That's right. So, the, so the, the, the first comparison's easy. Is it greater than or equal to zero? That's an easy comparison. But the comparison, the comparators, as I go f through the quantizer stages, get harder and harder. I have to get more and more accurate, because I, each bit is more accurate than the last one. So the first one is a signed bit, and then I keep going from there. Now, the DDA filter has a, the DDA converter, sorry, has a similar filter in it. So it also faces the same, it's the same design spec as the anti-aliasing filter in the A to D converter. So it's equally hard to design and implement for 16 bits, for high sampling rates, et cetera. So we're going to use what I will talk about today are useful, will be useful in both the analog to digital conversion and the digital to analog conversion. Yeah. All right, so just a few slides and what I have already said in words. So this is the cost of um, you know, increase the number of bits. I increase the number of bits. I'm going to be increasing the stop band attenuation. So this stop band attenuation basically is at 90 dB. So I can certainly go from, say, you know, something here around, you know, 60 uh, dB. This is for audio, right? So we're going to be trying to get a pass band out as close to 20 kilohertz as we can over the range of normal hearing. And you can certainly add more stages, more RC stages for a passive implementation to try to get, you know, in principle, down to 90 dB of stop band attenuation. The, the problem, of course, here is um, it's harder and harder. You're going to have to be more and more accurate in your designs. Actually, this is, I guess, RLC. Uh, more and more accurate in, your, in the tolerance of your components. So we talked about quality factors, or I guess we, we talked about quality factors back in lecture six slides, toward the end of lecture six. So the, you know, so each, basically each of these now, my pole locations become very sensitive. And the, more, the higher the order I have, the more likely I go vivo unstable. And I also have more likely to amplify noise. So they kind of go together. So this is a, it's a big problem going to higher order implementations. And again, about, above about 10th order, it's really hard to get a, a, this kind of design right and reliable when you manufacture it. Second one is the quantizer. So this is a plot of uh, input amplitude. Uh, on the horizontal axis, 
and the op and the vertical axis is the output. So this is the input amplitude. And this is a deviation from what it should be. Of what you'd expect to come out. And so what you see in this plot is, as I'm uh, down to about minus 60 dB of, of signal level versus full scale, 0 dB would be full scale, uh, I'm pretty accurate. I get almost no deviation in, in the level that comes out. Now the problem, so how many bits is minus, how many bits is 60 dB, roughly? 10. So roughly 10 bits. So 10 bits were in pretty good shape for implementing the quantizer. And again, this is an audio example. These, these figures come from uh, Pullman's book on, on principles of digital audio, and I, I reference that on this title slide. Um, okay, so this is... Uh, this okay. Now, what's, so this is about 10 bits. Now, I start seeing a breakdown as I get close to... Um, as I get close to what, probably right about here, I start seeing a breakdown. Yeah, so certainly I'm at 12 bits. Yeah, so 12 bits would put me right about here, 72. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm considering the offset constant zero. So this is about 12 bits. So I'm pretty good at 12 bits, and then chaos happens. So now what it's saying is, basically anything beyond about 12 bits, I can't reliably quantize. Okay. And it's just, it, again, it's about an issue of cost effectiveness. I mean, can I build, could I build a 16-bit quantizer? Sure, probably for, you know, an outrageous amount of money, something I'd never put in a product, yes. But in terms of, we want to get these down into something we can ship in large quantities, tens of thousands, millions. So it just becomes cost ineffective, really. Um, at these higher uh, uh, bit value, number of bits in the quantizer. Okay, so these are two. These are trying to make an argument that the classical approach of anti-aliasing filter sampling quantizer doesn't work very well, even at audio CD rates, which for us is you know 1982. This is old school. This is 32 years ago. You know, so it's you know even then this wasn't going to cut it. In fact, the original CDs couldn't even get you 16 bits. It was a 16-bit format. About the first 14 bits were good. Bottom two bits were noise in the original CDs that shipped. All right, so let's talk about some solutions. So some digital signal processing to the rescue here and some clever stuff in analog signal processing as well to make it work. So there are three tricks that we can do, and putting them together makes it even better. Here are the three tricks that we can, we can use here. One is oversampling. It's a good thing. So if I oversample, it means I'm, and I, we did this with, uh, I guess if you're on video, we did this in, in lecture um, 14 slides with uh, pulse shaping. But we, so this oversampling is going to capture frequencies way above half the sampling rate where we can't even hear. So it's okay if some error, quantization error goes into these high frequencies. Because what we can do, put the noise that results from quantization into these high frequencies, and then just low-pass filter and get rid of it. How easy is that? That's cool. Oversampling is pretty easy to do, and we get a lot of benefit from it. The second one is not so obvious. One is to add, so this is number two. Number two is to add noise. Now, normally adding noise is something we like to avoid. But what happens in these data converters, and I'll show you plots, is that if I put in a sinusoid into a quantizer, I get nonlinearity as a result. I get harmonics at the frequency of the cosine, I put in a one kilohertz sine wave or cosine, and I get harmonics at two kilohertz, three kilohertz, four kilohertz. It sounds terrible. What should have been a single tone is now this harmonic structure that just sounds terrible. It might be a cool studio effect, but it's not what the recording intended it to be. So we'd like to be able to break these up, and we can do that by adding noise. So we're trading off an increase in additive noise for a reduction, even a masking of these harmonics that shouldn't be there. Go ahead. So basically, are you saying that we're going to add, right, so let's just say you had like a three kilohertz sine wave, are you basically having like a, a negative like um, sine wave to cancel out um, those other harmonics? Like, no, we're just adding noise, and it turns out, so the harmonics are much lower in 
strengthen the original signal. So if we can add enough noise to raise the noise floor above the strength of the harmonics, you won't hear the harmonics because they're buried in noise. I'll show you plots of that coming up. Right. The last one, a little filtering to the rescue, not a surprise in this class. So we're going to take the quantization noise that results from quantization, and we know that this quantization noise is spectrally flat. It's uniform. We've talked about modeling this in Lecture 8 slides. It is a uniform distribution. It's a uniform random variable. It has its noise. It has spectrally flat power spectrum. So basically, the quantization error goes into all frequencies more or less equally. So the good news is, if we can have oversampling, especially if this works really well with oversampling, but it also works even without oversampling, which is to put the noise into frequencies that we're less sensitive to, either this works for audio, it also works for, for visual, um, for, for cameras and image acquisition. So it turns out our hearing is less sensitive at high frequencies, and eventually we can't hear beyond a certain point. So we like to put the quantization error into high frequencies because we're less sensitive to them. Go ahead. Um, if the noise is used for all frequencies, how do you control it? Uh, by feedback and filtering. That's the shaping. So the shaping here is done by feedback and filtering. We're going to feed back the quantization error, and we're going to filter it. Easy to compute, easy to implement. All right, let's look at some of the state of the art in 20-bit, 24-bit um, audio converters. And this is with respect to whatever the audio format is. So if the audio format is in a 44.1 kilohertz or 90, what, 90, 90, what, 96, I think 192, whatever they are, this is the oversampling with respect to the actual audio format. So and this is a lot of oversampling. So there's an internal clock that's sampling much faster than the audio format. So there's three different examples. The internal quantizer, if I, you know, if I increase the sampling rate, the oversampling rate, then I can't have as many bits per sample because I'm reducing the amount of time the quantizer has to work. Right, less time, less accuracy. Adding dither, it turns out, and I don't know why this is the best thing to do, but it, it's, in a lot of, it's in Pullman's book, it's in other um, literature, other papers. Triangular PDF, and we talked a long time ago about generating triangular PDF. And you probably looked at me funny back then, but this is why we do it. Pretty useful. How do I generate triangular PDF? Do you remember? Convolve two rectangular pulses, two rectangular uh, PDFs, or um, in other words, if I uniformly, if I uniformly, if I have uniform distribution of a of a bit. Of one and zero, so they're each half half likely, right? And I convolve that. That's to say, I add two random numbers together, independently generate it. The PDF is the convolution of their PDF, so I get a triangular PDF. No, add. We want to we want to add, right? Because when we do is when we remember for random variables. Yeah, for random variables. So if I take uh, z and I add x plus y, and they're statistically independent, right, then I get the convolution of their PDFs. So if x is a uniformly distributed bit source, equally likely zeros and ones, and y is uh, equally likely zeros and ones, add the two together and I get a triangular PDF. Really easy to generate. There's a filter in the feedback loop and it, the order, you know, is pretty high. And here's a dynamic range that you can, that you can certainly get to um, using these different tricks. So 120 dB, what is that roughly? How many bits? 20 bits, roughly. This is A to D. On the D to A side, we have more accuracy. D to A, we can get to 24 bits analog. A to D is a little bit tougher. Go ahead. Um, can you repeat what dynamic range is again? 
dynamic range in this case is the um, the range of the the maximum value you can you can hear in the ambient. So if you so in the context of audio, playing music in a room over speakers, the dynamic range is the the volume that you're playing at minus the ambient noise in the room. It's what you can hear above the noise. It's an SNR measure. So I have signal power from what's coming out of the speakers, and I have noise power from the ambient noise in the in the room that I'm playing those speakers in. All right, let's kind of knock off. Let's see what I would do here. Um, all right, let's go through it. All right, oversampling. So this is the again, this is the first this um, top plot is if I didn't have any oversampling, I'd have to have these. Amazing analog anti-aliasing filters with sudden transition, 10% roll off, but 90 dB down, 98 dB down, really hard to build, hard to manufacture. If we oversample, now I've got all these. So here's this oversampling by four, which is also the examples later on in lecture 14 slides. Um, so now I have all this frequency, all this spectrum that I can't hear. Right Now actually the frequencies I capture are up to half the sampling rate. So I can't, so here's frequencies I capture at four times over sampling. I can't hear those. It's a great place to put quantization noise. Can't hear it. What's also nice is it really simplifies the analog filtering. The analog filter reduces to sample and hold. How good is that? RC, one, one resistor, one capacitor. And sampling, clock. How, I mean, how easy is this? I don't have to worry about it. 10th order or 20th order, anything. Okay, so this the analog gets really s relatively simple, not trivial, but relatively simple compared to, you know, some crazy 20th order elliptic filter. Okay. I'm gonna do a lot, I'm gonna do a lot of filtering in the in discrete time. Okay, yeah, this will be important. All right, so think about a sine wave that's an amplitude very close to just one least significant bit in amplitude. So it's going to alternate between two levels, very low amplitude sine wave. That's an A. Now in B, if you just quantize this, I get, I get a very harsh um, square wave. If I add noise, and this, again, this doesn't sound intuitive, but if I add noise to it, in this case, it's going to be, um, it doesn't tell you which one, but if you don't want to bet triangular PDF. So I'm going to add noise to A. So this is, this is you know, C is basically A plus noise. And low level noise, almost a level, uh, on the order of one least significant bit. And then if I amplify, now if I quantize, I get a pulse width modulation. I get a pulse width modulation signal that on average carries the actual information of the original um, low-level sinusoid. Okay, so let me, let me show you that in action. All right, so here's a one kilohertz sine wave. Again, one kilohertz is used because that's the sweet spot of human hearing, very common test signal. One kilohertz sine wave, amplitude of one half least significant bit. Without additive dither, we get a square wave. If we then add the dither of one third least significant bit, and then we quantize. We get this. We get the this pulse wave modulated waveform that you see here. If I then take that PWM signal and filter with a just an averaging filter that's of length 32, I get something that I can almost get back to the original sine wave. Now, if I filter strong more, a little bit more heavily, I actually get back pretty much the original sine wave. So through adding dither before quantization and appropriate filtering, I can get back the original sine wave, even though it was close to basically the least significant bit in value. I can overcome the nonlinearity by adding noise. A little bit strange. Another way to look at this, I think this one's a little bit more clear. So I start with my, again, my sinusoid. I, and now the sinusoid is over about, I don't know, five quantization levels. I quantize it. So here I quantize. 
I then look at the error that results. Output minus input. I look at the Fourier transform of that, and what you'll see is the one kilohertz uh, sine wave plus harmonics at one kilohertz. And these harmonics are much lower than the uh, one kilohertz, but you'll see them spaced right, right here. So these are harmonics at one kilohertz spacings. All right, so what can we do to fix that? Uh, take the sine wave as it is, add noise. So add noise to it. The quantization now is this pulse width modulation, then we PWM wave, a signal. The, the quantization error looks crazy different, which it is, much noisier. That's okay, because when I take the Fourier transform, I now have my one kilohertz sine wave in a bed of noise. And that's what we'd like to hear. If we're trying to, re you know, trying to play back a one kilohertz sine wave with high quality, we'd rather have a one kilohertz sine wave in noise versus all these harmonics in noise. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that I don't know how much noise to add. Again, these, these tend to be... You know, you definitely want low-level noise on the order of a least significant bit. If you, because if you add more than the least significant bit, you've just wiped out your least significant bit. So I think there's a trade-off in finding out, because you want to raise the noise floor to the point that you bury the, the harmonics. And you add the noise after you bury You add the noise before... Uh, uh, yes, let me just go right to the, the final story. Since you asked. So here's the full uh, ADD converter as a block diagram. So we have the sample and hold circuit running at an oversampling rate, oversampled by a factor of m. Our quantizer is here. We add noise before the quantizer. So it's at the quantizer input, low-level noise, less than the least significant bit in amplitude, less than the step size. We're going to compute the quantization error, just output minus input across the quantizer which is spectrally flat in theory. In practice, it's pretty close. And we're going to filter that so that the effect of this filter will, will cause that quantization error to be high pass or high frequency. We're going to push it out to high frequencies. High frequencies, right. So as a block, this is FIR. But because it's in a feedback loop, it becomes IR. This can be four tap, six tap, eight tap. It's going to be pretty small. And let, so, what comes after the quantizer? I can quantize to five bits, six bits. Then, what I do is I apply an FIR filter to filter out the out of band noise that I can't hear anyway in the audio case. And it also serves as the anti aliasing filter before I downsample. So, the pass band here is going to be, is going to be essentially pi over m. It's a pretty narrow low-pass low filter, and we know there's an efficient implementation of this. Probably can bet your money on this one. We'll talk about this in the review session. But there's a nice polyphase filter bank form of this for efficiency. But that's the full converter. And you notice the analog components now. I need a sampler that runs faster. Sample and hold. I don't need an analog filter anymore other than sample and hold. And I need a good quantizer. Now I can crank up the number of bits almost to my heart's content. To 20, not any problem. All right. So go back over the slide I skipped. It's a pretty cool example. And I'll see you on Wednesday for a review. What's the number? For what? For the, the oh. evaluations. Get, get out the instructions. It tells you it's either 242.